This is the In the Rabbit Hole episode archive project. What you're about to watch and listen to is a past episode from In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting intherabbithole.com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel now. And now, two guys that got taken to an alien ship only to be brought to their leader, Aaron and Jonathan. Howdy, and welcome to episode 61 of In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. In this episode, we get medieval on the seven deadly sins of survival. We're your hosts, Aaron. And Jonathan. And you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Today's show is sponsored by Cat's Coffee. If you're looking for truly exceptional coffee to help you survive the morning or the next zombie apocalypse, you need to be drinking Cat's. They specialize in the finest coffee from sources that prioritize environmental responsibility and are fair trade certified. Their goal is to achieve perfection in every cup. Check them out at Cat's, K A T Z as in zebra. Coffee.com or click on their bright green banner on the site and make sure you're dealing with an official sponsor of the show. Again, that's cats, K A T Z as in zebra, coffee.com. Today, Jonathan is on allergy medication. Woohoo! So it should be an extra loopy show. And speaking of loopy, we have the seven deadly prepper sins for you. This is actually going to be kind of an interesting show when we were thinking about what we were going to do and what we hadn't already covered. This was one that really needed to be covered and we never really had. And it was essentially, while we're kind of poking fun and using the seven deadly sins, it's really about balance. So to start off with, let's talk about bullets. If if that is your entire plan for preparation is I am going to arm myself to the teeth. And this kind of ties back into last week's episode with the survival mom where she was talking about, you know, guys and all of our guns and all this stuff. And we all do have that tendency, and especially especially as preppers, a lot of us have the tendency to immediately turn to guns as the answer to whatever it is. Or as soon as we start freaking out to think, oh, shit, I need to buy more bullets or I need to buy another gun. I know I'm guilty of that. I'm clearly, clearly guilty of that as well. <laughs> Especially when you're medicated, like today. Uh huh. Today, on days like today, I try not to touch the guns, though. <laughs> I'm sure your wife and neighbors appreciate that. True, true. So, what happens if you have all bullets? And actually, I want to stop right there because there is a really and and Jonathan and I both are pretty pretty adamant about this and it, and it just makes my skin crawl and i and i think it does you too john oh yeah well it's, you know before we even jump into what we're going to say some people are going to say oh well you guys are hypocrites you've got guns and bullets and the answer is yes as part of a well-rounded prepping plan we have guns and bullets that but is a very good also point. have the other pieces you need yeah so yeah it make it does make my skin crawl though yeah well and anyway, we actually have to say what it is that makes our skin oh yeah crawl, that's true which is when I hear people say, well, I'm just going to buy bullets. And when shit hits the fan, well, I'm just going to take what I need. Yeah, those are the kind of people that I want to shoot before you need to prep. Yeah, and, and actually, I'm glad that they've told me that that is their plan. Because I'm like, great, whether you were planning on being in my survival network or not, I know who to shoot first. Exactly. These are selfish people. <laughs> truly selfish people and that is exactly what it is it's selfish and I, and i've heard people that are parents say this and i'm like so you're now purposely going to go out on the offensive and put yourself in harm's way to take care of what you should have taken care of before anything right. went wrong which was prepare for your own stuff and not make your plan to be Take other people's stuff. And I, I can hear people right now saying, no, no, it's not selfish. It's survival. And that's not true. You never hear, and I'm sure it has happened, but you almost never hear about the wolf that went and killed the rest of his entire pack because he got hungry. 
wolves tend to hunt in packs and they tend to die in packs too because they know that their best chance of survival is to work as a team and not to just go shoot other people or other wolves. I've never seen a wolf shoot another wolf. Hey, I've seen it happen. All right, all right, I'm buying it. He, he got the pet death penalty though, so you know, it was cool. That's <laughs> awesome. I'm glad to hear that. They just, handled it. They handled it. The wolf justice system hard at work. Yep, exactly. And, you know, I was going to throw in that the reason you don't want to stock up on all bullets is because you can't eat a bullet. Well, you may, you, you, but it, you'll only do you it once. But, but it defeats the whole prepping purpose at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would tend to agree with that. And it is like we were talking about a second ago. You're, you're, it's a very unbalanced and that's where and that is kind of where survival chi comes from, and that's the concept behind survival chi is that it is a balanced approach to survival. And honestly, if you are a skilled, talented, trained hunter, and you live in an area where things are plentiful, maybe you could say, "Hey, I'll do a little bit less food and more bullets," but you still have to have the well-roundedness of the food because you're not going to always be able to hunt. You can't, as most hunters know. As an individual, it's very difficult to take an entire, say, deer and, uh, and utilize that as one person or two people. So you end up wasting a lot. And waste during a survival situation is bad, too. Yeah, it's especially bad in times of plenty, but it's even more of a no-no in times of survival. Right. It's just bad form without getting into a Donald Duck routine and not making sense because I just start screaming. It just it really bothers me when I hear people say that. Yeah, plus it's it's just not a safe way of thinking because you're making the assumption that you can take anything you want. You're also making the assumption that your neighbors aren't armed uh, and causing that kind of conflict. One of the things we said many, many shows ago, and I honestly can't even remember which episode it was, partly medication, partly because it was a while ago, uh, was the whole idea of in a survival situation, the one thing you want to do is not get hurt. Because if you get hurt, you're being able to uh, have someone fix it is very limited. And so when you really think about this, you don't want to cause a conflict. And like I said, you don't know how well armed your neighbors are. You don't know how well armed the person you think you're going to take something from. And I don't think any, but honestly, most of the people listening to this show probably at this point have already figured out that it's not an all bullet strategy. But if you're new to the whole prepping scene and you've heard this many times, of, oh, I just got my bullets, rethink the situation. So that we don't end up beating it up too much. I mean, I think everybody at this point has kind of gotten the idea. Oh, I'm positive we'll roll back around to it. (laughs) We have a tendency to do that when we get irritated about a topic. The idea of all food. And I've seen this in, I don't want to say, I don't know if more liberal is the right term, but probably is where someone is, well, I'm not comfortable taking a life. I would call that the hippie philosophy. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty safe. And, and for the hippies that we do have, we have hippie friends. We, we roll yeah. with hippies. I think at one point in my life, I was a hippie. But the idea that you're not willing to defend yourself. Or your children. And that's, I that's think, the you big know, one. survival mom uh, in the last episode wrote a really good point. Talk to any mother about what she would do to defend her children or protect her children. And you will get some pretty uh, rabid responses usually. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it's the same idea here. What would you do to protect your family? Yeah. You know, even if you wouldn't take a life for yourself, would you for your family? And it may not even be an issue of taking a life as much as it being able to purely have the, uh, the show of force and the willingness to use it may actually be a preventative in and of itself. Yeah. I was watching something and I don't remember which show it was because there's so many survival shows out now and it was it was a hippie couple and they had this really cool combat and i i had compound envy i will oh yeah oh the one that they lived in the missile silo ah yeah yeah i think at one point i did spend a couple months looking for missile silo because there are some here in texas but they're all either full of water or they've been or they're just it would take so much to bring them back up it's not something that one person at least of my means or anybody that i hang out with on a regular basis has the means to sadly you're very right <laughs> yeah which will come to that one in a bit too but the the idea that that was all they had was fortress and then they had food and that was great and they were in a very special situation where they probably abandoned marauders at least in 
in any reasonable sense, which is kind of weird to say with the next part of this conversation, which is any reasonable sense of a complete shit hit the fan where there's roving hordes and 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 Mad Max and they're attacking this missile silo. Well, that missile silo was designed to fend off nuclear warheads. So, so they're probably pretty safe. But, you know, even the owner of that silo admitted that he does have a weapon strategy. He just wasn't going to talk about it. Yeah, and he he did say that he was he was uncomfortable and that's fine. And I think everyone should be uncomfortable with the idea of taking another human life even if it's your job because I think it once you lose that complete and utter taboo. Yeah, perhaps taboo that all inhibition of killing another human being then we get into a dark area of humanity. And even even when that's our job, I think it's it's something that does there needs to be some semblance left of that that is not great to do, even yep. when the other person really, really was asking for it. Well, and that could, I mean, it, even going back to the bullet idea, the whole idea of taking a life that isn't in defense is is reprehensible. Mm. And and that's the way it should be looked at. Yeah, that guy agreed with his wife, who was like, "Absolutely not, no way, no how." I'm like, well, "What's what's the, what's the point? You're you're not willing to do everything you need to do to survive. That that is even reasonable and within your rights as a human being to protect yourself, right? As a living creature. Mm-hmm. So if all you have is food, you have no defense. You have no means of fending off attackers. You have no means of keeping what is yours and the guy that spent all of his prepping time gathering bullets because that person will be out there i mean if we if we ever get to that situation that person will be out there i have a feeling that person is not likely to last very long right going back they're going to be putting themselves in harm's way a lot but it's still that person is going to be out there and so you need to be able to defend what you what you have and what you've accumulated to be able to keep yourself and more importantly your loved ones. Well, and just a slight variant of the food concept is you know these seed banks that you can buy. People who believe that I'm just going to stock up on seeds and then I'll have food. And as you know very well from the urban farming um, that you've been doing, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of people who are good gardeners understand. Having a bank of seeds does you no good unless you've actually got it in production. The more I do this urban homesteading, gardening thing, the more I realize how difficult it really, truly would be to do. I think even even whether I was in an urban environment or not, unless I was on a rural piece of land that had running water, and right. e- and even then it would be incredibly labor intensive. But the situation we're in, it's I can very easily see where, yeah, that's you would spend your entire day, seven days a week, just trying to make that productive. And then, well, and it would take you a while to get to the point where it even yeah. produced. And that was, uh, that was one of the things that I really do that Rawls, that while I didn't like his book, he, he does have a point about that. And he has a point about having three years worth of food storage. Which at first I thought when I first started reading it years ago, I thought it was kind of nuts. And then I kind of realized where he was going with it, which was if you had three years of storage, it would take you probably that long to get from zero to having a productive agriculture system of your own. Because you've, you've got to allow in one season is just going to get screwed. The first season, the first season you're going to get it screwed up. The second season, Mother Nature will screw you. And the th- third season, you'll probably get it. And that's why, and going back to what you were saying, that's why I don't like those survival seed banks, unless it really is that you have that background and you know what you're doing. And well, and if it's a backup, and it is a backup, backup solution. And, yeah, and you're aware of how, and you've accommodated for how long it's going to take you to get into production, and not oh, well, in one season we're going to have all this. I mean, right? Not a, I've got a bunch of land. I've or better yet, I don't have that much land. Let's say. You've got a, a 4,000 square foot yard because we are talking about urban survival here. Mm. And uh, so I've got a 4,000 square foot yard and I'm going to grow from seeds, nothing more, a farm. I mean, you have to really think about what that means and how difficult that will be to achieve. Without other stores, without food stores and, and even, you know, the whole idea of bullets and such because protein is a good thing to have as well. Protein becomes more than just uh, 
a nice to have from the grocery store in these types of situations. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So to move on to, since we were talking about seed banks and stuff, and we talked about fortresses a little while back, if all you have is a fortress, if all of your plans are bug in, and that, that's it, that's all you've got, what happens when whatever the issue is affects that home? I mean, there are instances we've seen. Right, or it doesn't go away quickly. Exactly. Or it doesn't go, doesn't go away to the point that you are able to cope with it. Right. And on a more, we've been kind of going through extreme examples today, but on the example of what's happened recently with all these tornadoes where these people's homes were completely taken away, well, that could have very easily also been all of their food stores or all of their bullets or hopefully both. I mean, not hopefully both that both were taken, but hopefully they had balance, but both would have been taken. And so if that is all of your plan, then that's, that is a very, again, that's a very lopsided plan, even if you've also met bullets and food. So the, there are lots of instances in any kind of disaster scenario that we can talk about, reasonable or far-fetched, where having a bug-in only plan is extremely weak. So you do also have to have some form of bug out plan. You have to have routes planned. And and the traditional ideas is that you have three routes out of wherever you are so that you have options. And also that you have a destination in mind and that you're not just left in that moment of crisis going, well, shit, where do we go? All right, I'm ready to go. I put I put plans into being and I'm. I'm ready. I can I can get out of my house in under five minutes with everything I need to survive for three weeks or three months. But if you don't, but I don't know where I'm going. But yeah, yeah, but if you but don't I know where you're going, there. yeah, yeah. Good luck trying to make that decision while while you're in the middle of some sort of catastrophe. Or, or even I'm going to bug out, and you know, I don't have any food in the place that I'm in or the place that I'm going. Yeah, I don't have a means of protecting myself, but I know that I can pack my stuff up and go. Well, that's great that you can pack up your clothes and and, and your kids and and get into the car. But you also need a fuel plan. (laughs) You need a food plan and a protection plan. Mm -hmm. And of course, like you said, Aaron, the most basic is where are you going? Yes. Where are you going? How are you going to get there? And I think we talked about this in a previous episode, and I could totally see where this thought process happened. And it's sometimes when we're when we're the only one working on a plan, it's we can kind of do stupid stuff or or just make simple, stupid mistakes. Part of this person's plan was to make it to Mexico under the catastrophe that they were preparing for. And yet the vehicle they chose did not have the range to make it to their destination. And their concern was that a total collapse of the uh, oil and gas system. And she said, well, when I get to that close, then I can barter for more oil and gas. Well, that's probably not really a good plan. Right. Since there's an oil and gas crisis. <laughs> exactly. This is the other part that, that goes along with balance, which is while you're balancing, you have to look at those deep details of what you're planning. And you have to really look for those holes and say them out loud, not just do them on your own. Even if it's on a forum somewhere. If you don't have somebody in your immediate presence and you haven't developed a network yet, then a forum like ours, hey, there's a little pitch for the forum where you can sound out ideas. And I know I I did that and I know Jonathan did that a lot and we did it as a group and we did it. We went on forums and talked about it with other people that, you know, and there there is a caveat to that. Sometimes you can get on forums and you, you know, you don't always know who you're talking to, and they can give you kind of wacky advice. But for the most part, if you're looking, if you're talking to people that are senior members of a forum and they're part of the discussion, and usually if something really goofy is being said, then those people will come in and say, no, here's why that's... Well, well, actually, the interesting thing about this show is this is a good way to weed out uh, the guys who really are just going to steer you in the wrong direction. If anybody ever tells you to rely on one thing and only one thing, then you're probably not talking to the right person. I would completely agree with that. Unless it's completely, you know, the tactical Weimariner alert system. Because, you know. Well, I rely completely on my Boston Terriers for all safety, food, and everything else. <laughs> I'm going to grill them up. They'll protect me. It's great. 
That's 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 a very interesting. It's almost like it's like an AR, very, but better because you can eat it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Very disturbing that we're talking about. They've been trained to go dogs. for the throat too, so you know. <laughs> they must be able to jump very high because your dogs are like a foot tall or something. It's crazy. <laughs> oh come on, box like a whole sixteen inches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so moving on to isolation. And this one is a big one in the prepper community and not so much in the urban because it's really difficult for urban survivalists to be isolationists. I mean, I suppose you could, but that would be extremely difficult at that point. I guess you're kind of the crazy guy at the end of the street that's a shut in or something. And that might as well be just be bugging in at that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bugging in. And and the, the, the fortress conversation we just had a few minutes ago kind of ties into this. The isolationist. Well, I'm going to move to Montana. And I think even uh, Lisa, the survival mom, was talking about this last week. You know, we, we all have that kind of fantasy starting off, or at least most of us have that fantasy starting. Well, I'm going to get a compound somewhere or I'm going to get a missile silo and I'm just I'm going to lock myself down. And while that would be cool, there's lots of problems with that. For one, it's usually crazy expensive to do. If you really look into it, it's very expensive to do, even if you do something as simple as get a piece of farmland somewhere or a nice vacation home somewhere that is isolated. But that's typically what we're really talking about are the people that move there and become isolated and are very far away from anything. Right. If your plan is to bug out to some way off isolated place, that's not really the same thing as what we're talking about here. Because, by the way, a plan to bug out to a way off isolated place in and of itself wrought with all kinds of things you have to think about. Like, how do I get from my urban dwelling to middle of nowhere Montana without any issues uh, during this real, you know, shit hits the fan scenario? But in this case, we're really talking about the guy who makes that decision of I'm going to go move out there, live out there, become one with the land. And if you can do that, if that really is who you are and what you're all about, well, okay. I mean, I'm not going to really say that it wouldn't work. But for most of us in an urban dwelling situation where we have a job where we're tied to, we have families that we don't want to uh, either abandon or move with us, it becomes much more difficult. It becomes very problematic. And it just yeah. it becomes problematic in that then most of your survival plans become lone wolf type right. survival plans. Uh, there's, you know, and this, this goes back to some of the reasons why... Jonathan and I are urban survivalists. There's world-class medical attention in both cities that we live in. Yep. And that's a big thing. You hurt yourself and you're, you know, an hour away at best from really good medical attention. Yep. Well, you can kiss the bullets, the food, the fortress, and your bug out plans goodbye. Because you isolated yourself to the point where you could not get medical attention in a reasonable amount of time. And let's right. say most things that are going to kill you are not going to be simple things. To say the least, you know, it's, it, the simple things you can usually protect yourself from and defend from. It's the more difficult things like you need antibiotics because you have a really bad infection. There's very little you can do about that yourself. Or something more pressing, a heart attack or a stroke. Right. To kind of back up for just a second, since... You know, we try to be one of the more reality based prepper shows. Every single one of us listening and talking and doing everybody involved in this show today, whoever ever listens to this in the future, we are all more likely to suffer a heart attack or stroke than any of the things that we tend to worry about as preppers. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of really drive home where isolationism becomes an issue. Right. And let's face it, most people are not in that great a shape. And even then still, I've known some people that were, my parents have had friends that were in amazing shape, that were guys that went windsurfing all the time and sailing and jogged, and they were in their mid-50s, and boom, dropped dead of a heart attack. So kind that's, at least for me, that's part of where isolationism becomes a problem. And if you have a more unique religious view, well, then there's other reasons where you're isolating yourself from your community and you're isolating your children from their community and how you'd want to bring them up. And you're getting, you start to get into kind of a weird area with that. And I think that's where we start to can largely get into where 
society as a whole has a weird view of preppers. Right. And I think, you know, it gets really simple in the, in the sense of isolationism sounds like a good idea to most of us because it's, okay, I'm going to remove myself from all of the potential bad that can happen. And, and then when you really start digging into it a little bit, at least the way I found it was, is that isolationism starts looking like a worse and worse idea the more you dig in, in the sense that, I mean, just starting with the most simple thing, which is, I don't really like to be completely alone. I, I like having my friends nearby, things to do. That's one of the reasons I live in an urban environment and why we started an urban survival show. Uh, many of you listening probably have the same ideas. And so it starts with that, and then it goes all the way in through the medical stuff, and it goes through where I just want to be living, and it goes through where I want my children schooled, and, and all of those things. And all of a sudden, isolationism, at least for me, becomes a non-option. For someone out there, it may be an option, but I think it needs to be considered very carefully before you say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to move to the middle of nowhere, because that kind of statement really makes you forget about all the other things you need to do. And perhaps the people around you and the things that they need to do. And if you're, exactly. if yep. you're the one making the decisions and you're dragging them into that decision. Plus, you know, even if you move to an isolated place, you probably still need all the other pieces because you don't know what will happen. I mean, you know, we like to think in terms of practical prepping. And when it comes to the practical things that happen, if you live in an isolated environment in Montana, you need to be prepared for blizzards that can last. You know, this, the blizzard itself may not last weeks, but you may be snowed in for weeks. Yeah. Uh, in which case you need the food, you need the energy for heat, uh, you need all those different things. So again, just focusing on the isolation aspect isn't going to help you. The concept of others will take care of me. And oh I, yeah, well, that's the one I go by, you know. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think this is one that, if you're listening to this show, it's probably not a mindset of yours. If it is, I have no idea why you would be listening to this show. Because, I, I mean, we're entertaining, but we're not that entertaining. That well, come you know. on. We do the show so that there's others out there to take care of us, right? Isn't that, wasn't that the whole idea? Shh, don't <laughs> tell people that was part of the master plan. You're doing it all the way now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but people who believe that, it just blows my mind. And, you know, everyone listening to the show is probably laughing right now. Like, oh, yeah, I got a neighbor like that. Or I got, a, or I got an uncle like that or a cousin or something like that. Yeah, because I think the most common thing heard from people, and we've touched on it a couple of times in shows as far as responses you can give these people, which is, oh, well, I don't need to prepare. You're preparing. I'll, pre- I'll, I'll just come over to your house. Right. And it's like, no, no, you won't. <laughs> yeah. And and actually, it that one right there is so incredibly similar to the Bullets one in how irresponsible it is and how selfish it is. It's, oh, well, I'm not going to do shit, but if something goes wrong, oh, well, you've done all this hard work. I'm just going to, I'm just going to come have some of yours. And, and right. I'm so wonderful and charming that, that you're just going to open the door and let me in and, and yeah, feed me and take care of me and. Right. Now, of course, the other end of this is, is the good thing, which is you do want to build a community of people who all believe they need to do their part. Exactly. But if you've got what you don't want to do is invite into your community somebody who either is not going to participate, refuses to participate or just thinks they're going to rely on everyone else. Yeah. And we've all met that person and we've all had that. We've all had that person that said, oh, well, I'll just come over to your house. Yep. Or you're exactly you're whatever. Your bullets and food. Exactly. Okay. And my answer usually is something like, oh, well, you know, you can definitely have one of the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I've also taken to saying, yeah, you'd make really nice Kobe person. We could get you some massages and read your poetry you for a few weeks. I'm, I'm, ah, refrigerator on legs. I'm sure you're quite tasty. That <laughs> usually creeps the shit out of people. <laughs> That ends that whole discussion yeah. in 30 seconds. <laughs> that ends a lot of discussions with that person from there on out, usually. but You might want to start eating more. You're kind of skinny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I did say that to somebody recently. And, and, and it kind of, they were like, okay, moving along now. And don't exercise much. You'll just get tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See those rabbits over there? That's why we keep them in such small cages so they can't move around. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's, that's not, anybody listening, that's not actually how we keep the rabbits. No, no, his rabbits are totally Kobe rabbits. Uh, yeah, Jason, <laughs> Jace, to diverge into the rabbits for just a second, uh, Jason McConnell was making fun of me yesterday. We went to go pick up some more rabbit cages because we're going to have another batch here soon. And I think we'll f- hopefully finally be up to the 
to the breeding level that we were have been trying to get to, we've sorted out most of the issues. And he was the the girl that he's now dating was coming along, and he was like, "Oh, he's he she he's the worst." He babies the crap out of these things. He's like out there every day patting them and talking to them and feeding them. So, yeah. Kobe rabbits. Kobe rabbits. Hey, they're going to be nice and tender and juicy and relaxed. Start feeding them beer. <laughs> Who says I haven't? That, good point. Good point. Actually, I give them the oats and I drink the beer. Whiskey mash, man. Whiskey mash. <laughs> Not giving them my whiskey mash <laughs> or my whiskey. So the next one is, and this these two are really kind of one and the same, but not really. Because well, yeah, I, I see one as looking at your friends and saying, "I'm going to take from you," mm-hmm. and then number seven being the government, of course, will take care of me. Is really that to me is even a lazier form of it in the sense that not only am I going to not even find friends who will take care of me, I'm just going to assume that some entity that exists will take care of all my needs and and. Uh, and make sure that I survive any scenario because, you know, I pay taxes, maybe. And, and government <laughs> has always done such an immaculate job of properly balancing its power and people's individual liberties and all that stuff. Exactly. And, and if well, you're new to the show, we are libertarians, and this is about to go down a libertarian rant, probably. Well, and, and you know what? I'll even, before we even go down that rant, I'll even say, even if you go to CERT, which is basically a program that the government put in place in order to teach you about what the government can and can't do or will and won't do even insert they tell you and they make it very clear that really it is the first responsibility you have is in taking care of yourself they will only come in to help when they can and that makes perfect sense to be honest i mean when i look at it that's actually probably one of the most reasonable things i've ever heard from a government official telling me look in an emergency we can't just come in in second one and make things right we have to wait for everything to die down, and then we can come in and make things right. And in the meantime, you've got to take care of yourself. And I'm looking at him going, that was actually the most logical statement I've, I've heard in a long time from anyone, let alone a government official. Yeah, it was kind of crazy to hear it from, from a government official. And that was, one of the, that was one of the, I think, the biggest lessons we took away from yep. CERT that maybe we didn't realize at the time, but realize it's, it's, as it's fermented and realized what the, the magnitude of what they said— and how to kind of go back to like Katrina, where everybody was screaming about FEMA and all this other stuff. And when you're sitting in that class and you really come to understand what the responsibilities are and what they very clearly state they will and won't do, one of which is put themselves in immediate danger. Right. Then you realize that that really wasn't their their job anyway. I mean, it's their job, but it's not, that's not the way they're ever going to operate to come in, in the middle of the danger. And, and not to say that things didn't get screwed up in Katrina because, because things did, but there were a lot of things that went wrong with that as far as the government's concerned. And a lot of it, if not half of it or more had to do with the local government, but that's a topic for another day or campfire or something. Yeah, yeah, we we don't want to get too political in this. And, you know, we know we take it down that path every now and then, but we do try to keep the whole show apolitical. But I think most people can agree that when an organization or entity tells you, hey, I'm not going to overstep this boundary, then you shouldn't assume that they're going to overstep that boundary. And I think it's unfortunate <laughs> that people think they will or that as as a society, we have a tendency to move that way. And you know what? I will. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and, and there is a very good reason for it. We get consumed with our own lives. I don't want to think about that stuff. I want to pay somebody to think about it. And I'll give you an example. I was hiring a new yard guy the other day because I, I just I don't like doing yard work. I, That's awesome. You finally got a yard guy. Well, Sorry, I, I, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been trying to find one that was actually decent and going to do what I was paying them to do for a couple months now, so my yard looks more like uh, the wilderness. but. The guy was telling me all these different things. And I said, look, man, I don't care. I don't I just give me a price. Tell me what you're going to do. Tell me when you're going to do it. I'm going to give you money. You're going to do it or I'm going to get rid of you. And we'll call it a day because I don't want to think about it and I don't worry about it. And in a lot of ways, that is the way we have a tendency as human beings. We are kind of lazy animals. We don't want to do stuff. And if we can pay somebody else to do it, whether we were being forced to pay for it or not, we're still like, well, I paid for it. I better get something out of it. And right. we have a tendency to become very lazy and place our responsibilities 
towards government a lot of times, which is to say, I don't want to think about catastrophes. I don't want to plan for it. I want to pay my taxes and I don't want to have to do all this work and all this study and all this other crap. Even though Jonathan and Aaron are horribly entertaining to listen to, I don't want to spend an hour a week listening to them to get that information, <laughs> to get that information, but, or, or, or whoever you're going to listen to, to get that information. But I mean, I'm being silly about it, but you get the idea that this idea that government will take care of me. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about the United States or if we're talking about Canada or if we're talking about the UK. It never works out well. Because in those situations where we're, we're talking about like Katrina or if we're talking about like the riots in Greece or the riots that have been going on in the UK or wherever, government has its limits and people don't realize that. And those limits are very clear, and it breaks down very quickly. They can only do so much, and when things get really bad, or when the people, or a lot of the people, get really upset about something, if it's their hockey team losing, or their soccer team losing, or if it's something more legitimate, then the system gets overwhelmed, and there's not much that can be done about it until it's all over. And then all the government ends up being able to do is clean up the mess afterwards. Hopefully if there's even anything left of the government after that. So it's very much like the last one, but I think even worse because it's even more asleep. Right. It just takes all responsibility and puts it on not even someone else, but an, a, an entity that you have no personal connection to. Yeah. It's at that point, you might as well be plugged into the matrix. Right. Just just stick me in a vat of jelly, plug some thing in the back of my head and give me a reasonably happy life. No no personal responsibility, no control for anything. Just take care of me and and I'll be your battery. And that's what happens when we take that approach to survival. And not that anybody listening to this show really takes that approach to survival. It's just this is the seven deadly sins. So whether you do them or not, that's what we're going to talk about today or what we are talking about today so that we don't now go completely off the cliff and and turn this into a a political rant what can we do as preppers and and we've had what is it we've had two entire shows on survival chi and even the last time we did it we then followed up with additional more more granular shows so to speak on decision making and everything else but but as far as the balance goes how do we achieve balance in our survival planning in that you do actually have to be organized if you catch yourself that like like Jonathan and I will admit to, we catch ourselves all the time spending too much time looking at guns and bullets, focusing on send number one. First, you have to recognize that. And it also may be very productive and effective to actually plan out how much time you're going to spend in a given day or in a week on the topic of survival and preparedness. And then break that up accordingly across the four major areas. Yeah. It, it, and. And always think through the whole survival chi as you think through whether it's bullets, food, shelter, where you plan to live, or who's going to take care of you. If you really think through the chi plan, you have a much different take on each item than you would otherwise. Yeah, because the the, the chi plan, is, they are individual aspects that right. make up a whole. Yep. And there has to be a balance, just like we've talked about, that there has to be a balance Otherwise, you end up in these seven deadly sins. There has to be a balance, and that, that is the balance that is in Survival Chi, which is, for those that are new to the show and haven't yet listened to Survival Chi, so it's community, health, and intelligence. And community breaks down to your immediate family, and then social circles, and then out to your friends, and then out to your community, and so on and so forth. And then health is your mental health, so staying not just positive, but in a good mental place not being crazy, and your physical health, so focusing on getting some exercise, at least to the best of your abilities, and maybe a little extra, eating right, doing the things that are going to make your life better day-to-day in your health, and your financial health, staying out of debt, not spending money willy-nilly, saving some for tomorrow, saving some for emergencies. This is a survival show after all. And then your intelligence, so knowing where you've been, knowing where you're going as an individual, as a nation, as a family, however you want to look at it, but also always seeking new information. And so in focusing on those, 
those three major topics and then breaking it down into the individual pieces, you can start to see the, where the, the balance lies. So you do need some bullets for your health so that you can stay healthy. And you do need food so that you can stay healthy. And you do need, do need bullets to keep your community protected. Right, and you need a bug-in plan and you need a bug-out plan. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily need isolation. I think personally that's just a bad idea across the board. Well, isolation to that extreme. But, I mean, you do need some place to go if you're going to bug out. Which right. Is- I, I, definitely, you need the bug out plan, which includes more than just how to get out, but where you're going. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you really need to just put aside the idea that someone else will take care of you altogether. And to balance it all out with, we talked about mental health a little while ago, which is not freaking out about any of this stuff and, not, and realizing that you're not going to get everything you want to get accomplished in a day or even in a week, or a year. Right. It's going to take real time to, to build up to where you're comfortable. And then again, I don't know if any of us that are concerned with it ever really truly get to a point where we are completely satisfied. Because I don't think you can be. I mean, unless, you're, unless you really are hunkered down in a bunker and you've got all of your best friends in the world and every video game and whatever you do for entertainment with you and you would never ever need to leave then there's always going to be some nagging something there's always going to be some hole in your preparedness sorry we had to stop the show for a second evidently the studio refrigerator just went out and or there was a belt loose in it or something so it was if you hear kind of a weird wacky noise in the background that sounded like a weed eater for about the last five minutes that was the refrigerator dying (laughs) all my ice cream sandwiches sugar-free of course are now melted Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, so that was a good point. And and I think all of us, the one you made right before, uh, we had to cut out for a second. But the whole idea of we're always going to be striving to do better. And I think that's part of the survival chi uh, philosophy as well. So always going be, you're always going to assume that there's more you can do. And there probably is always more you can do. But that whole idea of striving to be better and knowing that you're doing the best you can is critical. This has been an episode from the In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting InTheRabbitHole.com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great survival stuff.